Last week, our psychologist from New York City, whose category is boxing, Dr. Joyce Brothers, answered the $8,000 question. Tonight, she's back to tell us whether she'll take her eight or leave it and try for 16000 on her march to the $64,000 question. And... Last week, our seedsman from Princeton, New Jersey, whose category is American history, Mr. Stephen Froelich, answered the $16,000 question. Tonight, he's back with his wife to tell us whether he will take his $16,000 and go home or leave it and try for $32,000 on his march to the $64,000 question. Come on. The greatest name in cosmetics presents the 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. Yes, the $64,000 question. Remember, if it's the finest of its kind in cosmetics, it's by Revlon. And now, the star of our show, where knowledge is king and the reward king size, Hal March. <laughs> Thank you, and welcome, everyone, to the $64,000 question. We've got a pretty full-packed show tonight, so let's not waste any time. Bill, who is Revlon's first guest? Well, Hal, our first guest on the golden threshold of the $64,000 question is from Danville, West Virginia, Stanley Skeen. Stan, <laughs> welcome back to the show. Thank you, Hal. How are things down Boone County? Well, just fine and dandy. My wife, Ella May, sends you her regards. Well, when you go back, send her mine. Well, I'll do that, Hal. And uh, by the way, the president and the vice president of Eastern Gas and Fuel Associates, the operators of my mind, both send you their regards and best wishes. Thank them, too. And they've just gotten a $10,000 free plug. <laughs> Stan, how long have you been a coal miner? Well, since I got out of the CBs, Hal, in... Uh, 49, that's about six years. Six years, yeah. Uh, anyone else in your family work in the mines? Oh, yes. Uh, my father was a miner for 40 years before uh, retiring, and I have also have two brothers in the mines, and uh, one of them is my immediate foreman, and I just come by it naturally, mostly. I figure it's probably your brother and dad. Mm -hmm. Sam, how many hours a day do you put, put into the mine? Well, we put a uh, regular eight-hour day, Hal, in the mines, 40 hours a week, same as all the mines. That's oh, the union, union. union sure. contract, yes. I want to ask you one thing. Mm -hmm. I imagine after you've had eight hours underground, you've really had it, huh? Well, it's not too bad, Hal. The work itself isn't, but uh, working on your knees does make it kind of hard, which, uh, incidentally, you uh, remember the song, 16 uh, time that... Yeah. It's dark and it's cold and the sun never shines. It's dark as a dungeon way down in the mines. <laughs> but just as long as I'm not, I don't concern myself much, Al. So long as they keep plenty of those escape ways out there. Yeah. Out before. That's in case of a cave in, huh? Yes, the thing, Hal, that the miner fears the most is being trapped inside by a cave-in or smoke or fire yeah. or something of the sort. Stan, in the years in the mine, have you ever been trapped in a cave-in? <laughs> no, thank goodness. I, I never have been trapped, Hal, but I sure have done some running, boy. <laughs> Stan, besides mining, what do you do in your spare time? Well, I have uh, two hobbies, Hal. It takes up a great part of my spare time. I uh, uh, Love to hunt and to fish, and also I have hillbilly music as a hobby. Hillbilly music? Mm -hmm. How'd you get interested in hillbilly music? Well, Besides dancing to it and singing it, outside of that, how'd you get interested? Well, I started off when I was small. I played the guitar and plucked around on it for a while, then went to the banjo and the mandolin and the violin and a few other things, and just plunking away at him. Just plunking away at all. <laughs> it's a good thing you didn't take up the musical saw. You'd have cut your fingers to shreds. <laughs> well, Stan, let's spring ourselves up today. Last week, you answered correctly the $1,000 question. We were interrupted right at the beginning of the $2,000 question. You ready to take up where we left off? Yes. yes all right. Sir. Mr. Fight, vice president of the Manufacturers Trust Company, is taking a two-week well-earned vacation. And this week, an assistant vice president, Mr. James Agnew, is replacing Mr. Fight. So, Mr. Agnew, would you please explain the bank's function? Certainly. 
The questions on which I'm about to break the seal have been carefully guarded in the locked safe deposit vaults of Manufacturers Trust Company, New York. Manufacturers Trust Company certifies that these envelopes were received directly from the editors and that no one has had access to their contents. Not Mr. March, not even I. Thanks, Mr. Agnew. Come on down. Stan, you ready for your $2,000 question? I'm ready. Let's get going. May I have that, please? Okay. All right, here it is. Your category, of course, is the Bible. Mm -hmm. Now, for $2,000, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were friends of Daniel. The first three suffered an ordeal in a fiery furnace. Later on, Daniel suffered an ordeal in a lion's den. Now, for $2,000, name the king who ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fiery furnace, and then name the king who ordered Daniel into the lion's den. Uh, well, the, the king that put uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the furnace was Nebuchadnezzar. That's right, for the first half. Now, who and, was the other king? And uh, the man who threw Daniel in the lion's den was uh, Darius the Median. You're right for $2,000. Dan, it's nice to see that you're taking as much time as ever. Well, you've just won $2,000. The next question's worth $4,000. What do you think you'll do? Oh, come on. For $4,000. May I have that, please? Thank you, Jim. All right, here it is for $4,000. Delilah, eager to betray Samson to the Philistines, tried several times to find out the secret of his strength. Three times, Samson fooled her. But the fourth time, he told her the truth that his strength would be gone if his hair were cut off. Now, for $4,000, what were the three misleading ways Samson told Delilah he would lose his strength before he told her the truth? Well, uh, he uh, told her to bind his, himself with uh, seven green widths That's and right. uh, to bind him with new rope. That's the second the third. And to... Uh, and to braid his hair in the web of her loom. You're right for $4,000. Stan, we'll get to the $8,000 question in just a second, but right now we have some real news for all the gals. Here's Barbara Britton with the first real lipstick news in 27 years. It's Revlon's Futurama. Futurama! A completely new kind of lipstick case. Beautiful case you don't replace. Aren't they beautiful? All these fabulous styles were created for Revlon by the famous jewelers Van Cleef and Arpel. Prices including the lipstick range from $1.75 to $32.50. You buy only refills and you save 35 cents on every one. Let me show you how easily you can refill a Futurama case. Just click and the refill is in. With no muss, no fuss click and the refill is out. You can change shades as quickly as you change your mind and your fingers never touch the lipstick. You can get Futurama refills in any of Revlon's three lipstick types. Living, 24 hour type lipstick, Lanolite, the non-smear type, and Regular, the luscious extra creamy lipstick, especially good for sensitive lips. Who wants an ordinary brass lipstick case now? I'll take Futurama. Futurama! How about you? Yes, gals, a good idea is to get Revlon's new Futurama. And incidentally, if your dealer is temporarily out of some shades of refills, please bear with us. They're on the way. Thank you very much. Well, Stan, you've reached Revlon's second plateau. That means that you can take the money of just won $4,000, quit, go back to Boone County, or if you decide to go ahead for any of the ensuing questions and miss, Revlon has for you a new consolation prize of a 1956 Cadillac convertible. That'll make awful nice riding in the mines or even around them. Oh, yeah. Now, what do you think you're going to do now? Well, I'll go on. For $8,000? You're familiar with the booth, aren't you? Mm-hmm. You can stand up in there. It's taller than the mines. Lynn, would you escort Stan into the booth, please? <laughs> Can you hear and see me? Yes. All set for your $8,000 question. All set. Here we go. May I have that, please? Thank you, Mr. Agnew. 
Stan, I'll read the question, then I'll repeat it once. You'll then have 30 seconds in which to think over your answer. Give yourself every opportunity. Take the full 30 seconds. Here it is. Among the greatest literature of the world are the Psalms of David. Of these, one of the best known is the first Psalm. For $8,000, recite the first three verses of this Psalm, ending with, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. I'll repeat that. Recite the first three verses of this psalm, ending with, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You have 30 seconds to think over your answer. Good luck, Stan. seconds are up. What is the correct answer to that question? The first psalm is, uh, Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate both, meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree that's planted by the river of waters, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, and his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You're right for $8,000. Oh, congratulations, Stan. I don't have to tell you, you've just won $8,000. Stan, I'm going to ask you to go home for a week, think it over, then come back next week and tell us whether you'll take the, one, you, the eight you won tonight or leave it and try for 16. All right? Okay. Stan, we'll see you next week. Thank you for being with us Thank on the show. You. All right. <laughs> Bill, who is Revlon's next guest? Al, back for the third week on her climb to the $64,000 question is our psychologist from New York City whose category is boxing, Dr. Joyce Brothers. Doc, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Hal. Are you all set to practice your psychology on me again? Oh, I wish I could, but I have enough trouble just practicing it on myself. That's something we've never explored on this program, and being a psychologist, you might be able to give me the answer. Which suffers the greatest anxieties, the contestants or me? Oh, the contestants, definitely. Oh, yeah? Yeah. You're sure of that, huh? Absolutely sure. Why are you so sure? Well, for one thing, you know what your function is on this show. You know that just what you're expected to do. But for a contestant, it's a, well, it's a new and it's a terrifying experience. It's kind of like being thrown into an ocean and told to swim for the first time. Well, what exactly are you afraid of? Me, the people out there, the microphone? None of those things. I'm afraid of the unknown. What, what are they, what's the unknown? The unknown are the questions you're going to ask me. <laughs> well, I'm a little afraid, too, of the answers you're going to give me. Are well, ready to take up now? I hope. Okay, last week you won $8,000, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. You're here tonight to tell us whether you'll take $16,000. It's that simple. Joyce, do you have a decision? Yes, I do. I'm going on, Hal. For $16,000. Joyce, no sense wasting any time. You want to step into the ring there with your unknown partner? Start. Lynn, would you escort Doc in, please? Can you hear me and see me, Joyce? Yes, I can. Ready for your $16,000 oh, question. I hope so. Okay, may I have it, please? Thank you. All right. For $16,000, I will ask the question, then I'll repeat it once, Joyce, and take the full 30 seconds to answer. In the history of boxing, the third man in the ring has often been as significant, significant a figure as the two fighters. Now, for $16,000, I will ask you to name these four famous referees. First, what, what referee holds the record for the greatest number of heavyweight championship fights that he refereed? Next, who was the referee in the hotly debated but completely legitimate Dempsey Tunney long count battle in Chicago? Then, what heavyweight champion decided to retire, named the two leading contenders for the title, then refereed the match? And finally, what man, later famous in the boxing world, 
refereed the comeback attempt of an ex-champ against Jack Johnson at Reno, Nevada. I'll repeat that. I'll ask you to name these four famous referees. First, what referee holds the record for the greatest number of heavyweight championship fights? Next, who was the referee in the hotly debated but completely legitimate Dempsey Tunney long count battle in Chicago? Then, what heavyweight champion decided to retire, named the two leading contenders for the title, then refereed the match? And finally, what man, later famous in the boxing world, refereed the comeback attempt of an ex-champ against Jack Johnson at Reno, Nevada? You have 30 seconds for your answer. Good luck, Joyce. One at a time. One at a time. Of course so. I will. First, what referee holds the record for the greatest number of heavyweight championship fights? Arthur Donovan. That's correct. Now, who was the referee in the hotly debated but completely legitimate Dempsey Tunney long count battle in Chicago? Dave Barry. That's correct. Next, what heavyweight champion decided to retire, named the two leading contenders for the title, then refereed the match. James Jeffries. That's correct. Finally, what man, later famous in the boxing world, refereed the comeback attempt of an ex-champ against Jack Johnson at Reno, Nevada? Tex Rickard. You're right! $16,000! Not much, you're not trying psychology. <laughs> you knew the answers pretty well. You what were you trying to do, time. make me suffer? <laughs> Congratulations, Joyce, you've just won $16,000. Now, your next question is worth $32,000. I'm gonna ask you to go home. If next week you decide to go ahead for the $32,000 question, we have some books for you to study in the interim. First, Nat Fleischer's The Heavyweight Championship. Second, Nat Fleischer's The Ring, Record Book and Boxing Encyclopedia. And third, Encyclopedia Britannica, Volume Three. Good Daddy, luck. I can't carry them. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you next week, Joyce. Thanks for being Thank with you. us tonight. Good night. <laughs> it certainly is dramatic around here to see people contend for important prizes, but not all of our drama is in the question or in the big prizes, because here is a dramatized moment from the pharmacal division of Revlon. Red, rough, hurt hands don't look very nice. And their scratchy touch can make even a caress unpleasant. Oh, they could be prettied up temporarily with a cosmetic lotion, but the real trouble is deep down. Red rough hands need healing medication to bring back their natural softness and beauty. They need medicated Silicare, Revlon's new medicated lotion, the first and only skin treatment that contains tridermol to protect as it heals and softens. Now, here's proof. Mrs. Phyllis Fay of New Jersey had detergent hands, red, rough, and badly cracked. Her doctor recommended using Silicare daily. Within a week, her hands were soft and smooth, completely healed and healthy, and they stayed soft and smooth because Silicare does what no cover-up cosmetic lotion can do. Silicare heals. And Silicare protects your busy, hard-working hands. Even the loveliest hands need Silicare to keep them soft and smooth and beautiful. I use Silicare. How about you? Yes, gals, how about you? Good idea here is to keep your hands soft, smooth, and nice with medicated Silicare. Thank you. <laughs> Big Bill Rogers, who is Revlon's next guest? Well, Hal, back for the fourth week on his climb to the $64,000 question is our seedsman from Princeton, New Jersey, whose category is American history, Stephen Crowley. Steve, welcome back to the show. It's obvious you've made quite a few friends among the rooters out there. Be Hi. Besides uh, studying history books all week, which I'm sure you must have done, what, are, what, are, what else have you been doing? Oh, I've been reading my mail. I've gotten hundreds and hundreds of letters, many from people asking me for advice. Advice? Asking you for advice? This is yes. switch. Yes. 
Uh, Vice than what? Sure, it, uh, there are letters from new arrivals in this country like myself, and they tell me about their problem of becoming a citizen. What sort of problems exactly? Oh, the same problem I had. Uh, they are afraid. Uh, the citizenship examination is about the most important things that can happen yeah. to any new American, and they are afraid they fail, and that would be terrible. Was that the only time you've been scared since you've been in America, Steve? Uh, no, I've been scared twice. Once at my exam and once when I got married. <laughs> That's normal. Steve, did you have any language difficulties when you came to America? Uh, no, how matter of fact, my accent has helped me. Mm -hmm. uh, people uh, are curious where I'm from and they start talking and get friendly and before I know I've made a sale. That's not a bad idea. Well, let's bring ourselves right up to date, which I'm sure you're interested in, as is our audience, as am I. Last week, you answered correctly, Stephen, the $16,000 question. We sent you home for a week to think over your answer that you're going to give us tonight. We also gave you three books, two history books, two volumes of history, and also a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, volume 22. Now, you're here tonight to tell us whether you will take that 16000 or leave it and try for 32,000. I have a question for you, Hal. I'm a very curious man. If I take the 16, will you show me what my 32,000 question would have been? Well, I'll have to get an acetylene torch and burn down one of the walls of the manufacturer's trust company. I really, I don't know what it is, and I, frankly, I, I think the ruling is simply that you'll never know. Well, I reckon I'll have to ask you to go on and... Cause You're going to you. find out for yourself? Yeah, there's only one way. Well, Stephen, it won't be long now. Care to step in the booth and get ready? Lynn, would you escort Stephen into the booth, please? Ready for your $32,000 question, Stephen? Yes. Good luck. May I have that, please? Stephen, as you know, I'll read the question once. And I'll repeat it. You'll then have 30 seconds in which to think over your answer. Again, here, by all means, take the full amount of time. Here it is. Of the 22 amendments to the Constitution of the United States, seven have been made in the 20th century. For $32,000, I will give you the number of these last seven amendments, 16th through 22nd. You tell me the year in which they were made part of the United States Constitution and the subject to which each refers. I'll repeat that. I'll give you the number of these last seven amendments, 16th through the 22nd. You tell me the year in which they were made part of the United States Constitution and the subject to which each refers. Here they are. First, the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th, 20th, 21st, and 22nd Amendment. You have 30 seconds in which to think over your answer. Good luck, Steve. First, the 16th Amendment. The 16th Amendment is, I think, one of the three made under the... Pre no, it wasn't under Taft. It was in early 1913, and uh, it is called the Income Tax Amendment, although I like to call it the Painful Amendment myself. Right. Now, the 17th Amendment. The 17th Amendment was made also in 1913, but not on the Taft. It was late in 1913. It was Wilson who was president, and it deals with the direct election of uh, senators. Is that the popular election of senators? Yeah, the direct popular election of senators. All Until right. then, they'd been elected by, through the state legislature, but this was the popular election. All right, All right yes. Fine, Steve. Now the 18th Amendment. The 18th Amendment was also made under Wilson, and I think the year was 1919, and it is prohibition. All right. Stephen, the 19th Amendment. I'm sorry, the 18th Amendment is prohibition. The 19th... The 19th Amendment prohibition. now. Oh, I see. Uh, the 19th Amendment is the, the women's vote, 
In what year? And the year was 1921, Otto Wilson. That's correct. Now the 20th Amendment. The 20th Amendment was made in the late administration, the last days of the Hoover administration, early in 1933, and it uh, puts the terms of uh, presidents and uh, the, the inauguration of presidents and Congress ahead uh, from... That's correct. That's correct, Stephen. Now, the 21st Amendment. The 21st Amendment was the first amendment under the Roosevelt administration. It was also in 1933, and it is a repeal of prohibition. One more now, the 22nd Amendment. The 22nd Amendment is the last. It was under Truman, and it, 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 uh, it restricts the term of presidents to two, and it was, I think, in, enacted in 1951. You're right for $32,000! I just heard the understatement of the year. Stephen just leaned over to me and says, that was a Lulu of a question. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry there was such a tough way to find out, but now do you know what the $32,000 question was? I know. Oh, all right, Stephen. You've just won $32,000. Your next question is the big $64,000 question. Again, I'm going to ask you to go home for a week, think over your decision, come back next week and tell us whether you will take the 32 you won tonight or leave it and try for 64. Next week, if you come back, decide to go, you can have in the booth with you an expert the subject of United States history. Stephen, we'll see you next week, and thank you very thank much you for very being much. with us. Before we say goodnight, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to remind you that all this Thanksgiving week, firemen and other volunteers are marching for muscular dystrophy. They are marching to give hope to 135,000 child victims of MD who will not live to grow up unless a cure is found in time. Give thanks this Thanksgiving by giving to MDAA volunteers, or send your contribution to MDAA, care of your local postmaster. That's the show for tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week when once again Revlon presents the exciting $64,000 question. Good night, everybody. If you'd like to be a contestant, just send us a letter addressed to the $64,000 question, CBS Television, 485 Madison Avenue, New York. Tell us about yourself and enclose a snapshot which cannot be returned. And now, a good night word from Revlon. Here's Barbara to prove that you too can end nightly pinups. Watch this. Madeline set her hair on this side with water, and on this side with Revlon satin set. And the difference speaks for itself. That's because satin set is no ordinary hairspray. Satin set is the one and only pin curl spray set created especially to free you from nightly pinups. And there's no lacquer. So buy Revlon Satin Set. And in just five extra seconds, you can set pin curls that last twice as long. Be sure to be with us next week when Revlon will again bring you the $64,000 question. Transportation for contestants brought back in the second week is arranged by American Airlines. American Airlines will fly contestants in luxurious comfort aboard DC-7 flagships. Martini Incorporated. Your announcer, Bill Rogers. <laughs>